Hey guys, just a little introduction before we start the main topic of today's video. Two days ago, one of my friends passed away. It was out of nowhere and completely unexpected. I wasn't going to post this weekend, but decided that I'd rather take this opportunity to send a message to everyone. You know, life is short and you never really know what's going to happen. One day you may be smiling and laughing with that person, and the next day they may unexpectedly pass away. It's cruel, but it's the reality of life, and one of the biggest regrets I ever have is that I never get to tell them how much they meant to me, and how much they impacted my life. It feels like it's beyond most people to really convey feelings of gratitude towards one another, and you know, that's natural. But I urge you to take this opportunity now to tell your friends and family how much they mean to you. It doesn't have to be long, just say thank you for being in your life, because you never know what's going to happen, and you don't want to wait until it's too late to have a chance. Anyway, I don't want to take up too much time here, so let's get to the main topic of today. Hey guys, how are you doing? I never thought I'd talk about this again, but the coronavirus just won't GTFO. So yeah, why don't we talk about viruses? Okay, okay, a few other channels have already talked about this, like ASAP Science, but their videos are a little simple. If you're watching my channel, I assume you're intelligent to some degree, because you wouldn't be watching a bunch of videos about science and biology otherwise, right? So I assume you already know what viruses are and what they do to your body. I'd like to talk a little more advanced, but don't worry, I'll make sure you can keep up. The topics of today's video include what the coronavirus is and how it damages your body, and then we'll jump into a few more juicier topics like how do outbreaks happen in the first place and why it takes so darn long to develop a vaccine for it. Now if any of those interest you, be sure to stay tuned. Ah shoot, this is where I'm supposed to roll an intro animation, but I don't have one. Now the most interesting thing about a virus is that you can't exactly consider them to be alive, nor can you consider them to be not alive. Our definition on what life is, it isn't exactly very robustly defined, partly because it's impossible to really say for certain where that line should be. Now our three main main categories is that the organism in question has to have genetic information, a container for that DNA or RNA, and the ability to metabolize. While viruses meet the first two criteria, they don't meet the last one, but that doesn't mean that they're not alive. If you don't know what viruses are, they're essentially just a shell of proteins that encases genetic information in other proteins. And what's so fascinating about them is that they survive purely based on the principles and processes of evolution, where they are able to pass down information to the next generation and reproduce, despite not being a full organism able to metabolize. The thing is, they require a host organism in order to produce offspring. In other words, if there are no other organisms on Earth, then there would be no viruses. I like to imagine viruses as just a floating piece of junk that infects whatever it comes into contact with as long as it's compatible to do so. There's no desire, no motivation to do anything, it's just there. So in that sense, in my own personal opinion, viruses are not alive. But that doesn't mean that people who believe they are alive are wrong, because there's no right answer to this. So after hearing that, what position do you guys take? Team alive or team not alive? While you vote on that, let's get to how these viruses reproduce, and in the process of doing so, they kill cells. This part is kind of important because it's part of the reason why outbreaks happen in the first place. Viruses have an outer protein shell, and on this shell you have these other proteins that stick out called glycoproteins. These glycoproteins are relatively specific, and they bind to a victim cell membrane proteins. Once there's a correct match, we have a conformational change of the virus's outer protein shell, which causes it to fuse with the host cell's membrane and dump its genetic information within. Once the genetic information is inside, it integrates itself into the host genome. This usually requires an integration protein of some sort. It then hijacks the cell's machinery to produce viral proteins and replicate its own viral DNA. This could happen within a cell for years and years. Viruses can remain dormant within cells for a very long time, sometimes indefinite. This is the lysogenic cycle, but once it reaches the lytic cycle of a virus's reproduction phase, it then bursts out of the cell with a bunch of little tiny baby viruses, which then go and infect other host cells. That's essentially what the life cycle is. Obviously, our body's immune system has a variety of ways to fight viruses. They can attack them directly, when they're outside the cells, and they can also attack them while they're inside cells as well. CD8 plus T cells is a type of white blood cell that goes around invading the privacy of other cells by touching them. They go around touching all the cells they can, just touching them. If a virus has infected the cell, then its surface proteins would change, specifically the MHC class 1 proteins. The CD8 plus cells would pick this up and kill the infected cell. <laughs> Imagine if we did this in real life. You'd have these officials going around checking if you had the coronavirus, and if you had a fever, they just killed you. <laughs> and by killing all the infected individuals, the virus spread would stop. Now I can see you fucks in the comments section saying, oh, maybe we should do that. And to that, I say, you can be the first to volunteer. This new coronavirus is specifically RNA-based, meaning that the genetic information it carries is RNA, not DNA. This is called a retrovirus. The only difference you really need to know is that they require a reverse transcriptase enzyme, which converts their RNA to DNA in order to integrate it into the host cell. In general, that means there's a potential new target for medicine. Retroviruses can be susceptible to drugs that target reverse transcriptases. 
sounds easy, it's not really, and most of the time a solution in another area is more optimal. We could block the glycoproteins from binding to our cell surfaces, we could inhibit integration, the list goes on. Antivirals are drugs mostly used to inhibit the life cycle of a virus rather than to directly kill it. Broad spectrum antivirals are generally pretty good against most viruses out there, and I believe they're using it currently to some degree of effect for patients infected with the coronavirus. Now the great thing about learning how viruses work is that they all work relatively the same way. All viruses infect cells by just injecting their genetic information and using the cell's machinery to reproduce. Name any virus and that's how it works. As a result, it can be pretty telegraphed on how these viruses operate, even ones we haven't seen before such as the new coronavirus. The problem would be on how to deal with them. Now coronaviruses are a specific class of viruses that causes cold-like symptoms. They often infect the lungs and cause respiratory illnesses. Without a vaccine, our bodies start off at a disadvantage because it takes time in order to produce secondary responses, and by then a large number of cells would have already been infected. Everything has to do with antigens. A new virus has new antigens, which our immune system would have to start from scratch to defend against. Existing antibodies from previous infections would have no effect, which is why an outbreak of a new virus can be devastating because not only are our bodies not adjusted to having immediate secondary responses to it, but also because there aren't any good treatments or cures. Depending on the outbreak, we could see different difficulties when dealing with it. The coronavirus, for example, has a relatively low death rate, and if you're young and healthy, you probably won't die. But the coronavirus has an incredibly easy method of spreading. Ebola, on the other hand, when it happened, had a death rate average of 50%. It was so deadly because it directly attacked your immune system itself. Obviously, one of the first steps to take when an outbreak like this happens is to make sure it doesn't spread, because once it spreads, it could really, really get out of control. One thing we do need to give China credit for is how fast they are able to quarantine major cities. We criticize China a lot for being so authoritarian, but this time it seems that their control is what made this situation not as bad as it could have been. That being said, I still do have problems with the way China handled the outbreak and other aspects, which I detailed in my previous video last week. So how does an outbreak happen? How does a new virus magically just appear and infect humans, especially ones that we've never seen before? See, these little fuckers come in a wide variety and can infect pretty much all organisms on Earth, no matter if you're a human, a plant, or a bacteria. Needless to say, animals therefore can be infected too. Remember what I said about glycoproteins and how they have to recognize and bind to a host cell's membrane proteins first before it can infect it? Well, that's actually the major reason why a single virus cannot infect everything. These proteins are relatively specific, so they bind to some surface proteins but not others. It depends on their structure. Animals are organisms that, out of the ones I listed, are the closest in DNA to humans, especially compared to plants and bacteria, which means viruses that infect animals can have a simple mutation on its glycoproteins that allow it to infect a new organism. If that new organism happens to be humans, congratulations, a new virus has appeared. This isn't the only way an outbreak of a novel virus can occur, but it's definitely the most common method, which is why a lot of them generally start when there is someone who comes into contact with a live animal of some sort. In the case of this coronavirus, it potentially came from bats, which spread through a seafood market, although this has not been confirmed. We know this because scientists have sequenced the virus and compared it to already known coronaviruses in the database, and found that it shares over 90% of its DNA with one that infects bats. It's likely, therefore, that this came from bats, but we can't confirm that yet. So now the question is, why does it take so long for a vaccine to be developed? See, the process of developing medicine is generally pretty rigorous, for a good reason too. You don't want to give patients medication that is ineffective or damaging. Vaccines are no different. It has to go through animal trials and human clinical trials before they can be used, and this process can take months. We generally have a pretty good procedure when it comes to this. Grow the virus in some way to make it less effective in an environment of a human body, but still have the same antigens, and then deliver those viruses to patients. Essentially, we're injecting weakened viruses, or just the antigens themselves, depending on the vaccine. The procedure is relatively the same for all viruses, but many other complications could arise. Each pathogen is different, and thus it needs to be grown in different ways. Discovering that new method could take time. Another obstacle is simply the lack of animals that can be used for animal trials. Mice and rats are the most common subjects when it comes to animal experimentation due to a few reasons I won't go into today. But of course, we also use other animals too. However, remember again when I said that the glycoproteins are relatively specific? They infect certain cells, but not others. As a result, it could be difficult to sometimes find an animal in which the virus affects. Sometimes there are viruses that infect humans, but do not infect animals, which could make animal research difficult. After all, if a virus cannot infect mice, it's useless to use mice as a subject to research whether a vaccine is effective or not. But even after all that, there can be little incentive for companies to start the development of a vaccine. Like I said multiple times in previous videos, vaccines are so cheap that it could cost money to develop and distribute a vaccine. So a lot of pharmaceutical companies may be unwilling to put their money into something that isn't profitable. Usually then, as a result, you would have government controlled or funded laboratories that would have to take up the job. As of today, there are several organizations who have started the development of a vaccine for the new coronavirus, including a few government institutions in China, the NIH, and various universities here and there in Australia and Canada. It's predicted that animal trials may be completed by late February or March. Clinical trials, however, is the slowest of all, and if everything goes well, hopefully we'll have a vaccine that passes clinical trials in a few months after that. If it doesn't go well, it could be finished by 2021, and then 
then even after it's finished, there's still a question of being able to mass produce the vaccine, which by itself could be incredibly time consuming. By the time a vaccine becomes readily available to the public, the outbreak would have already ended. So yeah, I wouldn't really get my hopes up on getting a vaccine anytime soon. Everyone would probably forget about the coronavirus by then. It's upsetting to know that this is the process we have to deal with, but it's just reality. Anyway, that's my time today. I hope you learned something new from today's video. Special thanks to Fireshard, Liam, and Don Jessica for being loyal supporters this month, and I'll see you next week.